Welcome to today's webinar. This is Mike Dolinsky here, and today we'll have Adam Smith on uh, along with me, and he'll be covering off the mycorrhizal part of the presentation later in the program. Uh, today we're going to be talking about peas and getting to know us. Uh, I've been doing some work recently on peas, and uh, although I never planned on ever doing a presentation on peas, here I am. I just like I never did, planned on doing one on uh, soybeans. And I'm not going to do too much of an introduction. Uh, for some of you that uh, know me, uh, you know I'm, I was trained as an entomologist, and now I've seen myself more as a plant physiologist and biologist. Uh, I should also mention that uh, because we try to keep these down to about an hour, uh, I break them into small chunks. So, for example, we'll be talking about nitrogen fixation and mycorrhizae later, but it'll be sort of a, a brief summary because I've already got a sort of a full presentation on mycorrhizae and rhizobium. So, uh, in many cases, go to uh, the Taurus website and uh, take a look at everything there. For example, I've got one on the cell on stress management, those kinds of things are already done. So some of that will not be covered in here because it applies across all crops. So with that, let's get going, taking a look at what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about some agronomic considerations. Then I'm gonna spend a lot of time on staging germin and, and the period of, of growth from germination through to maturity. Then I'm going to do a short session on Athenomyces because we've been doing some research work on Athenomyces and I want to just give you uh, our idea on, on some of the things we might look at going down the road since we have no resistance, uh, as far as I can tell. And then Adam's going to talk, and I'm going to talk about nitrogen fixation, and then uh, Adam is going to cover mycorrhizae, and that'll be our presentation. Then we'll have questions. So uh, get ready, and um, if you have any questions, just pop them on later on. Under the agronomic considerations, uh, I'm not going to talk about these bottom ones, harvest, bugs, diseases, and weeds. Uh, in fact, I may do a, a session on, on insects here before long uh, for, for all crops, the major ones that we're looking at this summer. I'm just going to make some passing comments right off the bat. Seed quality and seeding rates. Uh, one thing about seed quality, and I, I have a little slide here, I think, on terms of damage. Watch. Uh, your seed damage, uh, and I'll show you why seed seed damage is really important. Seeding rates where we're now into the about seven, eight plants per square foot, so that's not a big deal. I'll show you a little slide on that. Soil types, it, peas are pretty uh, pretty good at uh, at growing almost uh, anywhere. The, the key things to watch for are excess moisture. They don't like wet feet. They're shallow rooted and they don't like high uh, salinity and, and don't like a lot of moisture. Compaction is an issue everywhere. So peas are no different than many other, other crops. Uh, you know, they, they like good organic matter. They like pHs in the range of, you know, six and a half to seven when you get into really acid soils. It's not that the peas don't like it particularly, but rhizobium don't like it. So really you're not getting the fixation you want. Um, and with that seeding, seeding depths, you know, I mean, people seed peas really early, and uh, there's a reason for that. Number one is if they freeze off, the the pea will will regrow uh, from the seed or from an axil if uh, above the uh, the seed if it's below ground. And I'll I'll describe that in, in a in a sec. Uh, one thing to watch for though is if the, if the seed starts germinating and dries out before it finished germinating and get some roots going, that can really cause you some problems. So uh, generally put her into moisture and I'll show you some shots about how much water peas take to imbibe. So you wanna make sure you're, you've got moisture uh, there for them to get going. On the fertility side, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty good at getting pea. Uh, you notice that I don't mention N there. I'll talk a little bit about N because N is a, a deterrent if the levels are too high. And almost all the publications, if you look at, say, the pulse growers, in many cases, in Saskatchewan, uh, say, North Dakota, Alberta, uh, there isn't a whole lot of micronutrients in many of those publications, uh, simply believing that uh, NP, K, and S are, are the key ones to, to look at. And I'll talk about nutrition and nutrients a little bit in a while. So here, here's common stuff, seven to nine per square foot. 
seating depth, man, you can go all the way from one to two to three inches if you have to. Uh, you know, but uh, if the moisture is dry on the surface, you got to get it down to moisture. Those peas will just sit there for a long time and grow very slowly. Uh, you know, uh, the faster you can get them up, the better. So you don't want to sink them down into cold soil and guys are going earlier and earlier. Uh, this year, things are a little bit later, so maybe they'll be forced to go into warmer soil because the plants will grow very quickly once they once they're, they get going in it and the soil is warm. You want to get early weed competition. Peas are not an aggressive kind of early grower, so get on those uh, weeds early. And seedbed des desiccation can often be a disaster. So as I've mentioned before, uh, watch out for that. Make sure you get them into good moisture and, and do some decent packing with your, your packer wheels to make sure that uh, the moisture is actually trapped in the seed row. A lot of times we've got so much uh, trash on the surface that uh, we don't get enough soil actually on top of the seeds so that when moisture is moving from um, deeper in the soil upwards, because as you make your your uh, your furrow or your, uh, your seed shank goes in, uh, that soil is loose. And if you don't pack it, the moisture that is rising uh, as that dries out is gonna be lost. Uh, just take a look at this. This is this is some work that was done looking at damage to seed. And if you get 8% damage in uh, in drill seed and, and aren't careful, uh, that's going to cost you. And you have to take that into account along with general seeding mortality, uh, seed mortality, uh, in terms of making your assessment on your seeding rates, which is common sense. Uh, now, I'm a big fan of, of tissue testing uh, because I know that in soil, man we got microbes that are affecting things we got ph issues we got you know lattices of clay clay soil particles that are trapping potassium trapping other nutrients and when it gets dry they can't get out so uh, uh make sure you're you're really looking at your your fertility and i would suggest that we start moving a lot more to tissues uh because that tells me uh what uh, the plant needs and I'll show you some stuff in just a second here about what we're looking at uh, with 2020 labs here in Edmonton and Winnipeg uh, in terms of uh, the nutrient density of seed and how it may affect vigor. Uh, so uh, we'll cover that in just a sec. Um, I'll show you a few graphs here. With zinc, boron and molybdenum as micros, uh, we need all the micros, we need all the macros. Uh, all the time in terms of a balance within the cells. Uh, so, so try and achieve that. It's very difficult because we got so much variability across the landscape and only so much we can do. So select uh, the key ones like uh, Elton Solberg say, go after the big fish first. And for example, zinc, uh, uh, I'll cover zinc uh, just briefly because in my stress management, I talk about zinc. Uh, it's really important in virtually all the enzyme groups. Boron is key in terms of uh, cell wall structure, and I'll talk about that in terms of epenomyces damage. And molybdenum is, is key in terms of nitrogen fixation. And moly uh, is really key in, in, in legumes, and, and it's been one that we've just uh, been adding to our, our, our new build formulation for Western Canada. Just to, to remind you uh, folks, if you've forgotten that the, 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 the amount of nutrient required, it goes in this sequence, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus, manganese, and sulfur. Uh, a lot of times when I talk to groups, they think it's N, P, K, and S, and those are the, the, the big nutrients that we need in the, in the maximum amounts. Uh, that isn't the case, they're, they're all important but there are differences and that gives you some guide in terms of what nutrients you, you really have to put in there in large volumes to actually support the growth of the plant. The micros are used in smaller volumes, but they're still really significant. Uh, so we don't wanna uh, forego them. Uh, I would make a comment about one boron right now before I forget. And uh, recent stuff that's been uh, uh, coming from Dr. Chakmak, is that boron is really showing up to be really key to root growth. And, and I understand that. Uh, and when we have good root growth, we get increased phosphorus potassium uptake. And the reason for that is that boron and calcium are tied up in the cell wall structure. And when we're growing roots, 
early in the season and we can't get boron, the cell wall structure isn't going to be sound. It's not going to be very, very good. So I can sure see why the boron um, is showing up uh, as key and it's showing up also in terms of soil and tissue tests that being deficient. Um, some of the recent stuff in about 50% of, of, of some fields. Uh, potassium is starting to show up in, in large areas of uh, uh, being deficient and to a lot of the prairies phosphorus levels after umpteen years of uh, canola growth production are also depleted. So I, I'm sure just urging folks to spend more time uh, digging into soil tests and tissue tests. One thing about field peas is if some of the guys in Manitoba that I, I saw were going to be on, uh, they're shallow root peaters. So uh, that's really good for us here where, uh, when we're using, when we have minimum tillage because we're getting tremendous stratification of immobile nutrients. These are some data from now, I guess, about eight, 10 years ago. So it's probably worse by now. But when we look at levels in the uh, soil, we can see that pea levels are, are stranded in the top couple inches. We keep putting it in the same place and it doesn't move anywhere. Uh, potassium levels, uh, they're a little bit more mobile, but they're still not there. And most of the potassium in plants doesn't go into the seed. It stays in the stems and the and the roots and the, and the chaff, so to speak. So it just piles up on the surface. We can see that zinc, which again, not very mobile. It's a metal, so metals just aren't even that soluble, never mind mobile. Uh, high levels in the upper zones, manganese, the same thing. So peas are pretty good at foraging. They've got a lot of uh, roots in the upper surface, uh, just like canola, big roots up top. And most plants are foraging for their nutrients in the top 10 to 12 inches. Uh, once they get below that, they're going after water because the nutrient levels are decreasing, oxygen levels are decreasing, pore spaces are decreasing and the cost of energy to the plant to go down deeper is also increasing. Now I'm gonna try and do something to help folks that are maybe newer into peas uh, by looking at comparing nutrients uh, availability and uptake relative to other crops. And we'll start out with nitrogen. You can see that peas, the blue line, the peas, take up a lot more nitrogen than other plants. And you'll notice as well that almost all the nutrients sort of peak at one place, and that's usually at when the uh, at the time when the plant moves to the reproductive stage. The plant has to build, <coughs> excuse me, that biomass prior to reproduction because then it changes its focus from growing leaves and growing reproductive parts to actually filling the seed. So nitrogen is big. Uh, we can see that with phosphorus, it's a tremendous amount of phosphorus in in pea plants as well, and then followed radically by canola, more so than, than lentils, for example, or spring wheat. Potassium, same thing. And you'll always see this curve here in, uh, in a lot of crops where we, we get this reduction in potassium after pollination has taken place or shortly thereafter. And uh, I think some of that is because it leaks out some of that potassium into the rooting zone uh, once it's sort of finished and moving a lot of those nutrients and it doesn't need quite as much as it did when it was in this rapid growth stage. I, I'm just not sure why that happens all the time. Uh, the big difference you can see that, and, and we expect this with canola, it's a big, bigger user of sulfur. And here's sort of the overall graph of there showing that uh, what I mentioned is you get branching starting, you get early buds here, and then you get late buds and you get flowering. So by about the uh, 12th, nine to 12 uh, node stage, uh, if you've got a deficiency of something, you better get on it because you're running out of time to get, uh, you know, typically flowers will start at between the 12th and 16th, somewhere 12th node stage. And if you don't get your nutrients on there, you're way, way behind in terms of supporting that plant through that flowering period and the filling period to fill those, those peas. So you're gonna to wanna to get in here at these earlier bud stages if you are deficient on anything to try and feed that crop. Now let's take a quick look at, at what peas actually take, take up and compare it to a few of these crops that we're familiar with. For example, peas, it takes up three pounds per bushel. 
So, you know, you're talking uh, 50 bushel crop, 150 pounds, which is almost equivalent to canola. Uh, soybeans take up a whole whack more. Uh, canola takes up a tremendous amount of pea, phosphorus, um, more so than peas do, uh, to my surprise. But take a look at the potassium levels. That's one thing that even peas take up more potassium than canola on a per bushel basis. Uh, so if if you have already been struggling with potassium levels in your land and your canola, and you've been growing a lot of canola, well, this is even going to take more potassium uh, than your canola. Sulfur, eh, not a big deal. We always know that canola needs lots of sulfur. Uh, calcium, soybeans, canola take up a lot of calcium. Uh, Peas take up a fair amount, half a pound per bushel. Magnesium, eh, they're not a big, big consumer of magnesium. Zinc, though, and there's a lot of southern Saskatchewan and other places that I see zinc levels are in the toilet. Uh, peas, for whatever reason, use a lot of zinc. I'm just not 100% sure. I haven't found anything in the literature which tells me why, but that seems to be the case. And I know why uh, soybeans take up manganese. It's, it's the way they handle uh, the uh, nitrogen that they fix, but the zinc, uh, they just need lots. So if you're in a zinc deficient area, you've got a, an added problem and that zinc uh, really doesn't fit in going on a, on a seed dressing if you're on a, a nitrogen fixing plant because there can be interaction and toxicity of zinc to the rhizobium. So you might wanna consider putting on zinc uh, at, at increased levels in the year before, just like you might consider putting more phosphorus in the year before and, and since they're immobile basically, uh, spreading that out into the rooting zone uh, and leaving some left over uh, from the previous year's crop. You know, a common practice that's still used in, in the United States for soybean production. Manganese, we covered. Copper, you know, all plants need copper for a lot of things, but take a look at boron, a fair amount of boron uh, in all of these plants, uh, and especially in, the, in uh, canola. So that's pulling a lot. Uh, and a lot of iron in canola. So if you didn't learn uh, anything much about peas, other than that, it, it needs some uh, materials, a lot of potassium, uh, a lot of nitrogen. You also found out that canola needs a lot of iron. Uh, now, this is a study we just finished with 2020, where we were looking at wheat, barley, and peas, uh, looking at germination and uh, vigor and we had some samples in and we wanted to take a look at what are the difference in terms of the nutrient density or the nutrients in the seed. And uh, I won't get into the overall uh, study, but it does show a couple of really cool things. For example, boron. Take a look at the boron and then we get to the peas. You can see how much boron there is in peas compared to barley and wheat. I suspect if we had canola, in this trial, we would have had high levels there. We have large amounts of calcium in peas compared to barley and wheat. Copper, about the same. Iron, not significant. Magnesium, eh, flops around the, all over the place. For you guys that uh, are more in wheat, you can see how much manganese wheat seed has in it. Then peas, tells you something about the importance of nutrients to the plant by what it puts into the seed. Phosphorus, pretty good. But here, potassium. Look at the difference in the potassium levels in peas compared to wheat or barley. As I said earlier, if you're already showing or struggling with potassium levels, peas are gonna, gonna maybe be a problem for you. You're going to have to take a look at your potassium management a little more closely. And you can see here, even the zinc uh, takes up a lot more than barley does and even some of the wheat. So there's quite a bit of variability there. And I'll just point those out, you know, in the phosphorus we talked about and the manganese and the zinc we identified. I have to go through these quickly and the boron. So those are the key ones that, and that's why I talked about them earlier in the day. When we looked at these, here's what we had for vigor. On this batch and this batch, when we, when we did additional vigor tests by actually cutting off the roots after 14 days, we found that group two 
uh, relative to a treatment with a primer on the seed, actually we increased the vigor significantly uh, in this group. Uh, and we're not exactly sure why, uh, but it's somewhere related to some of these micronutrients likely in in the seed, and, and this is just the start of where we're going to go in the future. So if we're going to grow 50 bushels of peas, we need 150 pounds of N, pile of P, lots of K, lots of calcium, and away we go, and the plants will get it. One thing with you guys, uh, just so you know, and I think you all know, there's a limit on how much phosphorus you want to put in with peas. I found peas are quite sensitive to uh, nutrients in the seed row. Side banding is, is much better and good soil moisture really helps you out, but be careful in terms of damaging your seed. Uh, I, I know many guys now are really considering uh, not putting much in the seed row or else putting in a liquid treatment with uh, low levels of nutrients in there just so we have a lot of feeding sites and can supplement that early growth. So we're going to take a look now at staging. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I put in both the typical staging, uh, uh, growth staging uh, platforms that there are, the BBCH platform, which is more European and related to Zadok staging. And this is a new one that is used on peas in the United States, which is based on the same kind of principles in the vegetative stages and the reproductive stages of soybeans. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details on that. I'll show you what some of these look like. But I, I would point out we're going to spend a lot of time on, on, on how the seed uh, gets going in germination, uh, the leaf staging relative to things like herbicide. Uh, not going to do much in elongation. Those just grow. We're going to talk about uh, inflorescence or flowering, emergence and flowering in a, in a big way about how plants flower. And we're not going to do a whole lot on, on ripe, ripening. I think most guys know how peas ripen. So that's there for your reference. So here we go on to staging. And uh, I'll put, put this out. The guys, part of the group in Taurus, tell me that the herbicides that are largely used for peas are Viper and Odyssey. And the labels say uh, on Viper, you want to be in the three to six above ground node stage. And in Odyssey, it's got a greater range between one and six above the um, uh, the ground in node stages. So uh, this is not as easy as you would think. Uh, and, and here's why. I, I looked through the literature and found all kinds of diagrams, no pictures, but diagrams of different ways people stage them. So, well, and then I'll show you my photographs here in a minute. So here's the seed at Germany. It puts out a radical and then it puts out a shoot. So this continues to grow, this radical grows down and expands, and then we get one node, which is a scale node below ground, and then a second node, which is a scale node below ground, and we get the clamshell enclosing the first leaf coming up. So this second node here, which is the scale leaf, will move above ground as it, as it elongates, and then we get, so this would be, they call this the first node, but most people do not consider the scale node below ground as a node. It's that this would be node one, the first set of stipules above the ground, and this would be node two, okay? They don't count that. So even, even in the literature, they make a difference. I wanna point out something else too. You notice that in, uh, in leafless varieties, which most of us are growing, I think, uh, there's something called a stipule, which is actually the leaf because there are no other leaves. There's the tendril and then there's the leaf. And you'll notice that here is the clam leaf enclosed. And later on, I'll show you what's inside of there, but you can see that it, uh, the outer leaves of the clam become the stipule or the leaves of the plant as it grows. And it just continues to do that. And I'll show you what's inside there. So here's a, a, a picture I think I stole out of Australia. Uh, and here's the cotyledons, here's your scale, there's your first leaf, first node. And this is the way I look at it as well. First node, second node, you can see it's sort of a, uh, doesn't really form. So we got node one, node two, node three, node four. So there's a stipule and a tendril at each one of the nodes. 
Now, here's uh, uh, just so you know, in terms of why peas can be seeded early and, and can deal with frost, uh, here's a soybean. And soybeans are what are called epigeal uh, germination. In other words, the cotyledon, just like canola, goes up above the ground. So the growing point is in here. If this freezes, the plant is dead. And that's the same with canola. Whereas with, with these that, that are hypogeal, the seed stays below, the shoot goes up, but there's usually enough energy there that if you froze this off, because this, uh, this scale is tight here because it's just the ceiling and it hasn't elongated fully, uh, this scale can actually act as a point where it'll put out a new shoot and, and start up a new plant. So these kinds of seeds can deal with frost a little bit better in terms of recovering from a killing frost. Now, we're going to take a look at how a, a, soy, a pea germinates. And this is looking at a, a stained seed while I was uh, doing some uh, primer. And you can see here is the actual radical sitting right there under the seed coat, and you can see it. This is where the seed was connected in the pod so it could be fed and pollinated. That's called the hillum. So take a look at this. I just pulled the cover off and there's the radical sitting right underneath the cover. So when I mentioned before damage to the seed, this is the part you don't want to damage. If this is broken or it's even cracked there, that seed likely will not germinate or it will be poorly germinating and will get overrun as it grows up, so to speak. Here is a seed germinating after about 48 hours, and this one I put below it just to show how much it expands and how much water it takes to get the enzymes going to cause that seed to germinate. When it germinates, it puts out this radical first, which is the root, and then it has this, which becomes the shoot. And I'll show you exactly how this works. And these two horns here, I'm not sure what the technical term is for it. One of them goes into each cotyledon. So you can see that the, radic the radical, which is the root shoot, is tied into one cotyledon there on this side. Whoops. And what, this one into the other side, and it just buries right into there. It's amazing to actually see. So here we have it going on. Now, this is the, the shoot, the plumule here, and watch what happens. It cracks there, and you can see it magnified here. You can see it's starting to grow, and when you cut that open, there is the shoot right here, sitting between the two halves of the cotyledon, and it's growing, and it's expanding. So if you take a look at it and you open it up, you can actually see the leaflets are already formed right here before it even pops out and you can see that this is now going to take and straighten this out and eventually and because this is the new root and the shoot and the root will form a junction here and they'll be linked together so that the root can feed the shoot and the shoot can feed the root and it continues out as it comes out it's you can see the formation of the leaflets and then there it is so it is now pulled out from in between the cotyledons, straightening up as it's heading for the soil surface as the root grows down. And out she comes. Here's your first a clam leaf. These are the, uh, here's the uh, scale leaf, and here's the first node, which doesn't really form much of anything. Oops. So here it's coming through the ground. You can see the tendrils here and here are, is the clam leaf. Here are the stipules from the previous one, the clam leaf going there. So here's what it looks like in, in the ceiling. There's your scale. There's your uh, node one, node two. And just take a look here. You can just see that the next clam leaf is going to be coming out of there. There's your one scale leaf, your second one. I would call this node one because you can see it has some stipules on here. This is your scale leaf. These are just plants that are growing. Again, this is node one, this is scale, and this elongation will take place here with time. At this point in time, you can see that these plants already have a fair amount of roots. 
These are just at the one, uh, two node stage, just getting going to seedlings. A lot of lateral roots. You can see that the lateral roots are much bigger near the top as the as the tap root continues to go down and produces more lateral roots as the plant sends energy down. Very nice lateral roots hooking into the soil there with the root hairs. The, the plant grows alternately. So there's one uh, tendril on this side, then the tendril on that side and back and forth. And you can see that uh, this is the only leaf that is on a, on a leafless or semi-leafless plant. And those along with the tendrils are what do the photosynthesis. So how does this happen? So you can see right here, these are the stipules, which are the leftover covering of the previous clam leaf. So the stipules remain, this was the clam leaf. Now the clam leaf is here and you can see that this put out a tendril, but this one has already got a tendril that is coming out here. So it's just gonna be the next one that comes out. So here's what, what it looks like when we look inside. So here's the stipule. If we look inside, here's another stipule that's gonna be the next node. And if you look inside that one, there's another stipule right here. So there's actually three sets of of growth nodes within the clam leaf, the clam, and here's how what it looks like under this stipule. So here's the message, and here's what it looks like in a in a full grown uh, look. At, and here's the growing point. This is where all the growth is taking place in that clam leaf and growing those in sequence. So it's an indeterminate kind of plant. It's producing these nodes. So it's got about three nodes going within the clam leaf. And then as it moves up, the old uh, uh, clam leaves become the stipules or become the leaves of the plant. So that immediately tells you that you have to fertilize this plant and reduce stress because even though what you see is just a small thing within that clam leaf, there is a lot of stuff going on. So we then have, here's the stipule from this node and keeps going on and keeps going on until we get to about the 12th node and then we turn to reproductive stage. Now I threw this in because uh, we want to support this seedling growing. So what do we put into a foliar nutrient? We put phosphorus because we're now going to be fixing nitrogen. So the plant besides having to grow all of these uh, nodes and all of this material until it gets to be the reproductive stage has got to fix, produce nodules and fix nitrogen at the same time. So it needs a lot of energy in terms of ATP, it needs potassium. As we said, it needs boron for cell wall structure, it needs manganese for stress management, sulfur, no sulfur in this one, zinc and molybdenum for nitrogen fixation moving into nodulation. Go back. Now we're gonna move into flowering. So we're gonna support this and I won't show this again. So to support flowering, we're gonna need some nitrogen, we need some phosphorus, we need potassium, we need boron for cell, cell wall structure and for um, uh, pollen tube growth. We need copper, iron, manganese and zinc for stress management all the time in terms of producing these things. You could read in the literature called SODs, <laughs> which are, are involved in stress management. That's why a lot of the nutrients that we put on foliarly in the micros will contain this combination because they're involved in superoxide desmutase or the management of, of free radicals in the plant. And then for, for the stress that occurs when a plant is treated with herbicide, because the plant really can't keep it out. So even though the plant is, uh, is tolerant, it still has to do something to get rid of that herbicide in the plant, even though it's not necessarily toxic, it does stress the plant out until it metabolizes it. So we've come up with a new one called uh, VPR, which is uh, compatible with uh, Viper to support the re-energization um, uh, for lack of a better term, of the seedling. A lot of energy and a lot of potassium. Potassium is really important for cells 
expansion in terms of a trigger pressure. Now we're going on to reproduction. In case some of you guys haven't been in school for a while, we'll give you a little update on what goes on in a, in a flower. We have the ovary, in this case would be a pea. Uh, we have the style, which leads from the stigma where pollen will land and, and grow down here so it can pollinate all these, all these peas. And we have the anthers here, the stamens. Now I wanna point out one thing. <clears throat> I just noticed here in preparation for this, you notice that the plant is producing these vegetative shoots and nodes until about the 12th node stage, somewhere 12 to 16. And then it'll produce on this, what is called a peduncle. And for you guys that have listened to my wheat presentation, you know that that last uh, part of the stem from the upper node to the, to the head is called a peduncle. So the blossoms are also on a peduncle, little shoot, and I'll show you this in a minute. And you get anywhere from one to three of these on each one of the reproductive nodes that start forming. Once the hormones change and it moves to the reproductive stage. As I be mentioned before, when we go to those growth curves, we wanna have this plant loaded because during this growth stage, we were growing all these nodes and it's the, what's in the stems and in the leaves and in the tendrils that will eventually be moved into the seeds uh, or into the, um, yeah, into the seeds to fill those seeds. But it also will be used to do all the work here. We have to now develop the, the pollen and I'll show you that in a minute and the ovules. So you can see that right here, you see? There's the peduncle. So you can have one, two or three of these on each one of these little reproductive nodes. The more nodes you have, the better. So what happens in pollination? Uh, pollen lands on the stigma right here at the tip of the, uh, and I'll show you this in live, so, so don't worry about that. And then it germinates, grows the pollen tube down. It enters the seed right here. On the way down, the sperm splits into two because it's a double pollination. The pollen tube feeds as it grows through here because it, I mean, it has to have nutrients and it enters the micropile enters the ovule, it busts open at the tip, and I'll show you that. One sperm joins this egg to form the germ. This one forms the cotyledons. This would be forming the plumule. The key nutrients in there are calcium. Calcium and boron, wherever you have calcium, you need boron. So that's why we put on boron uh, going into bloom. Uh, and if, if you turn into a real dry situation, you might even be short of calcium. It is the during this reproductive stage that we can lose a lot if it's hot because we have drought, we have lack of water movement, therefore we don't get nutrients uh, moving into the plant. Plus the heat itself causes sterility of the actual pollen. The other thing is if it's really, really dry, the stigma tip does not get stay moist very long. It's it's perhaps better in peas than it is in canola because the actual keel protects it from, from being open. In canola, uh, the, the, the pistol just sits out there in the open and it can dry out. So that heat at this time is really critical and that's why many people see peas real early trying to, to get them up and pollinated before it gets to the heat of the summer. So uh, that's why we have calcium and, and boron in their lot and the pH changes and this thing feeds. It actually is feeding as it going by ectocytosis. It's gathering uh, nutrients and so on from the style, which the plant is pumping nutrients into to feed the pollen tube. The only other thing that grows like this in plants is the root hair. It's a single cell like a pollen tube and it grows the same way. That's why when we say that boron is critical for root growth, it is because all of those root hairs are what absorb about 60 to 70% of the nutrients and they only live about five days. So for that root to go through the ground, just like this pollen tube, it's gotta be fed. And boron, calcium, and all these nutrients are really key to keeping all these cells going. So here's a bloom, a blossom, and we're gonna look inside. This is in the early stages. So if you wanna go and figure out when your plants are gonna actually pop, uh, you can do that. Now I'll make one comment here about pea leaf weevil. A pea leaf weevil uh, will feed on those clamshells earlier. They don't necessarily feed on the blossom. 
But if they're feeding on those clamshells and they and they chew in too deeply and damage the clamshells, uh, they probably have some effect on uh, some some of the growth. Uh, most of the time, we don't worry too much about the feeding uh, by pea leaf weevil because it's the larva feeding on the nodules that cause most of the damage. But let's take a look at the pollination. So here we have on this peduncle, you can see that this is sitting on a on a bit of a, a peduncle, and you can see that. Uh, I'll use this one, it's bigger. You have all these anthers and they're yellowing. And here's the, the stigma right here where this hairy part is. Uh, I'll show you that closer. And you can see that this is early because there's no pollen on it. And this pollen isn't uh, really bright yellow. So when we look at those, and I remember I said there can be one, two or three uh, of them involved in this before the, uh, on, the, on the reproductive node, and they're sequenced. You can see in this one that this one is older than this one. And you can see that the pollen is starting to yellow here, whereas this is not at all. You can see that this is a magnification of, of this one. I was after the stigma. And you can see that the stigma hasn't even fully formed and the pollen isn't mature. So if you get excessive heat at this time, uh, it is tough on the plant, especially if you're already in a drought because uh, the uh, reproductive parts don't get excessive nutrient flow from the plant, unfortunately. As the plant grows, it becomes yellower and yellower and more mature, just like we do see that in, in wheat as well. So here are three blossoms on this uh, uh, node, and each one of them will extend out as, as they grow. And you can see that these are early, they're still blossoms because there's no pollen on here. They haven't pollinated yet. There's a close-up of it. Uh, and you can see all the hairs. So the, this is there, it's self-pollinated uh, peas, uh, and the pollen will, will leave the anther and land up on here and then grow pollen tubes down here. That's a close-up of it. So <clears throat> here's, here's the actual whole thing. So you can see that this one has already got the remnants in its pistil of the pod. And this is extended up into the keel uh, of the blossom and it's ready for pollination. You can see at this point, no pollen, that the ovules are already there. All the seeds are already grown. So if you do not have that plant loaded with nutrients before it goes into the reproductive node stage, these are not going to be fully supplied with nutrients, especially if it turns hot and dry on you. Now, here we have it pollinated. So we have the uh, the anthers. You can see are all or the stigma is all covered with uh, with pollen. Now it has to grow. Each one of these grains is going to race down here trying to get to a seed, and it takes one pollen grain making it there to pollinate each one of these seeds. If it doesn't get pollinated, it'll abort it. There's another shot of it. Uh, so uh, this is sticky generally. And many plants have this hairiness there, plus a lot of uh, secretions to feed the pollen tube when it germinates and escapes the pollen grain and starts growing down here. You can see there's lots of pollen. It's not a matter of shortage of pollen. And in most cases, it's, it's uh, health of the pollen, how well it's formed, uh, how well it can grow, what is the vigor is like. It's kind of like a sperm, just going. So, uh, after it's pollinated, you get all these seeds that start to then grow. If they don't, then they're aborted. So you can see here that some of these seeds just never got going versus these that fully form. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's about the average you get from, from seeds. And that's how it takes place. Boom. There you go. You see, on the peduncles of each one of those nodes coming off of here, there's a pod. So the more nodes you get in the reproductive stage, the healthier the plant, the cooler it is, the more nutrients you got, the more pods you're gonna get and the more success you have. And you'll notice that the first one, just like in wheat, which starts pollination in the middle of the head, the first one is the biggest, got the biggest seeds and probably the one on the bottom because that's where they're first set. And that's why you'll see the big set on the bottom and as it dries out, and less and less nutrients, it eventually shuts down and the plant is ready to go into maturation. That's the end of that story. From there, it starts drying down and away you go.
Okay, apenomyces. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because for guys that are growing uh, peas and haven't got apenomyces, they should do their darndest not to get it. It's very destructive. It's like the club root of peas. Uh, it's similar in that it has o, o spores which form mobile zoospores. In other they can swim, like little, little flagella uh, uh, that they can swim. So we know that Aphenomyces is worse where it's wet. And that's because the, the zoospores cannot actually swim. So as a result, away they go. Uh, their uh, you know, ability to reactivate during the season as well, not just in the springtime, they can move deep into the soil. Peas are susceptible, lentils are susceptible, and sizer milk vetch uh, uh, is also su uh, susceptible. We have chickpeas and faba beans and soybeans aren't, so if, you know that's about your only choice if you if you get it. And the zoospores are swimmers and they infect the root hair. Uh, necrosis, do 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 the root tip. So they infect the root root tips and the root hairs in the plant as well. Uh, what we get is a, a pinching off here right at the soil surface, and I'll show you a shot of that. I mean, this is just fusarium, but the roots become uh, a honey brown and kind of decayed looking. They get water soaked like this. These are trials we're doing where we're looking at using uh, calcium sulfate with boron and calcium sulfate alone to strengthen the cell wall structures and the root hairs to prevent infection. And you can rate them this way. These are just some scalings, uh, ratings that we have. We have no resistance to this disease at all. So we're looking at nutrient and nutrition as a way to handle it. Uh, now here are some uh, factors on, on risk. If we have, if we have uh, crop history that's shorter than four to five years, you're running a big risk. If you've got a wet spots, you've got soil moisture that's high, you're at higher risk. Compaction really leads to uh, water, a lack of water penetration into the soil and water logging. So that's another factor. pH, it likes acid soils, similar to club root. Soil temperatures are perfect for us and it causes root rot. And this is what you get. If you got patches like this, usually low spots, that's your first sign. Similar here. If you got water runways where spores can move down and then settle where it's wet, those are the things you look for. Uh, again, rotation, try and buy good seed if you can, that's free. There's no real treatments for, for this, uh, either on the seed or as a foliar spray. So uh, be uh, aware of it. And that's about the end of the story. And if you do get it, look at uh, resistant kinds of crops. Last but not least for me, quickly on nitrogen fixation. I think time is a fleeting. Uh, nitrogen fixation takes a lot of energy. Nitrogen is a triple bond to form ammonia, uh, ammonia in the in the um, in the nodule, and that takes a whole pile of ATP. So that's why we need that phosphorus there to make that work. Now, <clears throat> Adam is going to talk about mycorrhizae, but I'll describe how the infections take place. Rhizobium bacteria actually swim in response to the plant growing to the tip of a root hair. Calcium spikes, that's the plant's response to uh, an infection and it approves the infection. The root hair curls around the microbe and it grows an infection tube. The plant does all this. It grows it down into, uh, down into the vascular system and then the plant grows nodule and the bacteria forms and starts fixing nitrogen. Mycorrhizae are, are in the soil the spores. They germinate in response to the plant from a hormonal response and mycofactors, which we can get into. If you wanna learn about that, go to my other webinar. They penetrate the cells and form what are called arbuscules. Uh, that's why they're termed arbuscular mycorrhizae in which they can exchange nutrients and water with the plant in return for uh, sugar but they'll bring in a lot of nutrients and Adam will cover that. Here's a, a nodule of a pea. You can see it's red and fixing nitrogen. If you look at it inside, uh, this is an exterior shot. You can see that uh, it grew that 
uh, infection tube down into the, the, the plant right next to the xylem and phloem here so that it can exchange nutrients both ways. Peas, right here you can see that the tip is, is still growing. So peas are what are called indeterminate uh, nodulators compared to soybeans, which are, are determinate. So this is fixing nitrogen. This is already old, and this is going to be new uh, material to fix nitrogen over oh, maybe a three, four week period, and then move that into the seed as it grows. When it's finished fixing, the plant sucks out uh, that nutrient and moves it up into the seed. Uh, and up into the plant and the and the nodule dies or as you know it disintegrates and last thing i'm going to do is just point out a few of the key nutrients in here this is nitrogenase nitrogenase is the enzyme that allows the plant to break that triple bond in uh, the nitrogen molecule look what's in it iron sulfur this is cysteine more sulfur and molybdenum the one place we need molybdenum in, in a cofactor to break that molecule as well as nitrate reductase and a couple of other enzymes. So that's why we need those micronutrients and macronutrients, otherwise we're not gonna have that happen. And pea plants are well equipped to take nutrients from the vascular system and move them up into the nodule to feed that nodule because the nodule itself cannot feed by extracting nutrients directly. It has to feed through the vascular system of the plant. Sugar's coming down and micronutrients coming up in the xylem, and that's a perfect system. <clears throat> this just goes to demonstrate how that works. And like, like the plant itself, which is controlling all this, it has transporters for sulfate, for molybdenum, for iron, for magnesium. So it's handling what's going into the symbiosome where, where the nitrogen fixation takes place. The plant is moving sugars and, uh, and other uh, nutrients into the cells through TCA cycle, taking that N2, turning it to ammonium, moving it into, uh, into ammonia and then into ammonium, converting it into some amino acids, moving it back into the phloem and moving it up to the shoot. So the, the plants are controlling everything that's going on. And I think I'm just about done here. Just to point out one thing, molybdenum cannot function without copper. It takes copper to make the five typical molybdenum uh, um, enzymes, including nitrate reductase, and this one aldehyde oxidase, which is part of the system that allows the plant to form abscisic acid. And my last slide. So here are the major factors that limit biological nitrogen fixation, excess moisture, drought, oops, soil acidity, a deficiency of phosphorus, excess N, you want, don't want to have too much N because you're growing these to, uh, to actually fix N, and deficiency of calcium, molybdenum, iron, copper, cobalt, sulfur, and boron. And that's the end of the picture for me, and here you go, Adam. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, just we're doing something a little different and trying to get a few people on with Mike uh, just to share our thoughts and, and be here to help if you guys got any questions. So I'm going to take on the mycorrhizae fungi. And, you know, Mike's covered a lot of it, I'd say. If you look at the <clears throat> slide here, you get, uh, we all know flax has always been a very high phi association with mycorrhizae fungi. And, as you work your way all the way down, you see canola actually does not associate with mycorrhizae at all. And canola has another mechanism that makes it very good at sucking up nutrients. So it really doesn't need that association. But what we find is it doesn't need it, but it becomes very hard on, on the biological in our soil. And we've seen that happened in the past where you actually get uh, some yield drag in years after canola. So regardless of what crop you're planting, you know, today we're chatting about peas and lentils. Uh, we can see we got kind of a medium, pretty high reliance on our mycorrhizae in our soil. And as Mike showed earlier, it, they have a very shallow rooting depth. So Anything you can do to help out those peas and lentils uh, explore more soil 
is going to be beneficial to growing those peas and lentils. So I think one thing I say is <clears throat> regardless of what we have for row spacings, our roots are really only exploring a very small percentage of our total soil area. So, you know, the number being thrown out there is one to 3%. Uh, our roots actually explore. We do have quite a few nutrients in that soil that we're just not able to touch. So, you know, in, e in easy terms, mycorrhizae can grow that secondary rooting zone to help bring in those nutrients that, uh, that those regular roots just aren't touching. Okay, Mike. Just carry on there. So we're gonna have a couple slides here just to look a little bit of the basics of uh, what mycorrhizae is. And uh, you can go back one more there. As Mike already said, the mycorrhizae is kind of in a spore form in our soil. And the plant actually activates that. It sends out that myc factor, the hormones, as he talked about, to germinate that spore that's sitting dormant in our soil. As it germinates, it uses the lipids or stored energy, no different than what's in our, uh, our seeds itself. You would say it uses that energy to drive itself towards the plant root and uh, a form that association. So Mike chatted on the arbuscules. Uh, if you want to think of what an arbuscule looks like, you know, within our lungs of ourselves, we would have bronchioles or alveoli inside of our lungs. Essentially, it looks very similar to what the arbuscules have. So it creates that network and it's going to bring in those nutrients um, and water. And as he said, exchange for the carbohydrates. It also creates a vesicle. Now, they've, uh, mycorrhizae has been, you know, in our planet for millions of years. And, uh, you know, they found a way to carry on. So they create this survival mode that uh, can be used to be a spore in our plant. So this is is how mycorrhizae and rhizobium work together. So if you can see the inoculation, uh, the bacteria actually travels alongside the mycorrhizal network. So it's exuding a food source that can help the bacteria grow. You know, it's a real benefit that not only does the mycorrhizae bring back nutrients to the plant, you know, maybe phosphorus for one, um, not limited to, but essentially, as Mike pointed out, the, the amount of nodulation is a very heavy energy process. So the more nutrients you can bring back to that plant, the more the plant can actually turn to making nodulation. So very neat that you can see that bacteria is also using the mycorrhizae, you know, fungal and bacteria working together. Okay. Next one's a little bit, we're going to slip over it. It's essentially a microscopic view of, uh, of what we just looked at. You can see the mycorrhizal network in the middle and uh, the film around the outside, helping that bacteria really move along and uh, follow that hyphae and help grow that, that secondary rooting zone, as well as uh, making nodulation a little bit farther down in your uh, rooting area, not just in the primary roots, but also down in some secondaries. So, okay. So as we get going, you know, there's been uh, stuff thrown out there. There's studies out there that, uh, you know, mycorrhizae can be 10 times more efficient than, than actual the roots itself. Um, with the root hairs. Majority of the plants we grow do have root hairs on them, but there's definitely a variance of, of what those root hairs are like. You know, in a previous webinar that we did with Mike, um, looking at some phosphorus studies, the soybeans actually have really, really small root hairs on them um, compared to something like a pea and a lentil, which would have a little bit better rooting hair. So there is variance even within the crops that we grow. But if you look at that network, you know, just how much more it could uh, explore the soil. 
look into you know crops that or fields that you guys might have yourself something like a heavy clay or that's really tight with some magnesium you know mike touched on compaction already that network of hyphae is so so small that it can reach into those tight areas that you know your plant root kind of turns away from because it's too energy expansive to try to get into those networks so okay you know one thing that i look at when i look at the mycorrhizae obviously i i look after a, a territory here in southern saskatchewan but uh just we talk a lot about nutrients you know and a lot of it is phosphorus that you know gets linked to mycorrhizae but really a lot of micronutrients as well and you know mike did a great job of talking about how micronutrients play into that as well so mycorrhizae can bring that in but really we don't talk a lot about water retention and you know for me in southern saskatchewan it's really a big deal because we went through a few years of again um in the past few years but you know in this study soil mc is moisture content of death there's 10 replicates there um you know as you can see at the bottom if you have inoculated you're just extracting that little bit more water uh before obviously the uninoculated side and you know on the other side when you get how many days if you have inoculated with in that you were gaining five extra days uh, so the amount of water retained in a great mycorrhizae network is is substantial it's not a get out of jail free card by any means but uh you know anything you can do to buy yourself that extra day or you know as we said mitigate stress it's all about how do we mitigate stress on these plants and and get them to maturity okay uh, i think we're going to skip over that one right now mike um here's just a video uh, as it goes in you can see that spore being nicely filled with lipid uh, and energy and it's already created this network and as it zooms in you can see there's like a four lane highway in there of nutrients going both directions and uh you know i think back to just a podcast we did the other day with uh, a grower joe gardner and you know that's like a super four lane highway full of super bees right there where you get you know nitrogen and micronutrients going towards the plant and carbon and carbohydrate i guess going the other way so not only that but you get water in there as well so very neat just to see how that actually works because you just can't see that stuff with the naked eye and in the field so okay I think a couple slides here I just wanted you guys to be aware you know obviously mycorrhizae is a, a newer type of product to our marketplace and you know be aware and have a little education obviously Taurus prides ourselves on education and there's a couple different ways to produce mycorrhizae there's there's been a conventional process that uh, you know grows them out in beets growing out in a greenhouse um, kind of a pyrrolite is a, a substrate that may be used and they grow these plants and you get a very good uh, multi-species because it's it's growing a plant. It's different. Every plant grows differently. So you get multi-species and, you know, they're using different spores and um, chopping up the roots and creating a product that way. And, you know, the one that Taurus and Premier Tech have is, you know, we've done it by aseptic condition. So we've we have a way to grow it without a host. We don't need to grow that those beets. And we get really good, consistent product with zero contamination and uh, really high quality that way. So we're very proud of that, that uh, there is a single strain that we, that we help sell. And uh, anyway, just to be aware when you're looking and comparing different stuff in the marketplace. So, okay. So the other thing to be consideration is uh, you can put all those on the slide there, Mike. There's three or four of them. 
I would say just to be aware of how labels are made because there is, you know, a little difference of what people are talking about. And, you know, we want everybody to have the best chance of success for mycorrhizae as they can. And, you know, there's different ways. And I'd say propagals has been one that you can see a difference on a label. And anything that's called propagals um, can be any amount of spores, uh, whether they're viable or non viable. You know, we talked about how viable spores were full of the lipids you know that down in the bottom left corner they're nicely filled with that yellow yellow amount where you know sometimes you can get damaged whether it's mechanical or just in the process and become unviable so propagals kind of can count everything they count kind of total hyphae fragments non-viables viables and you know, that's one way to describe what's on a label. And, you know, I guess in our stance, we we look at viable spores. We want to have the ones that have the the total amount of energy to to germinate and be there. So just be aware when you're looking uh when you're looking at what's going on and get the best chance of success for everybody. Okay. So maybe if you can just back that up a little bit, Mike, I think the ones uh, right there, I just want to show the rooting area. Obviously, we chatted about how far, you know, root hairs go in millimeters. And uh, you can look at mycorrhizae hyphae in centimeters. So there's a really big amount of difference that you can have. And if you looked at that in a in a total root area, you you'd have another plant beside that where you actually are connecting your plants from not only hyphal to itself, but also from plant to plant. And, uh, you know, it gets to be a really big deal when you get everything connected and we're using that much more soil as we talked about that 2% uh, soil. So more you can grow that area, connect your plants, explore that soil. And, uh, you know, that's really it for me. We talked about the rhizobium. Choose the rhizobium that's meant for you and choose the mycorrhizae that's uh, high quality. And, you know, we're gonna, not going to chat about the bacillus today. We're going to probably do other webinar stuff on it. So, well, thanks everybody um, for joining. I guess Mike's not on there anymore. So, please be safe and uh, out there. And we wish everybody a uh, Great seeding season, and we hope we can get to the field as soon as we can. So thank you very much, and have a great spring.